Well, I've got some genuinely exciting news this week. Young Heretics, in its new, updated, and improved, relaunched format, which has been going on for just under a year now, has just received over one million downloads. And I think what that means is that you're all stuck with me for the foreseeable future. Could not begin to express my gratitude to each of you for listening. Whether you've been with this show for all four years in its various formats that it's been around, or if this is your first episode that you're just tuning in for, welcome, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for being here. It's truly my joy to sit around spending time with the great works of the West, uncovering and recovering the traditions that have made us who we are, and sharing them with you. I Definitely didn't think I was going to be doing this this long. I started this show not imagining that it would reach that many of you, not imagining that it would break through the noise of the news cycle, and thinking that my interests were probably pretty niche and maybe it was a lost cause to resurrect the significance of Elizabethan verb forms or, you know, whatever thing I'm on about today, Homeric verse or and all of that. But... Actually, it has turned out that a lot of you out there, like me, are hungry for richer soul food than the internet typically provides if you just scroll through the latest big flashy color and sound bite that you're getting from whatever feed you happen to prefer. We're all feeling, I think, addled and disoriented and dissatisfied with these kind of social media stream feed style news stories that pelt us all the time. And also we feel disconnected from the greatness of the past. We feel cut off from our heritage, sometimes intentionally, sometimes in in universities, for example, there are political reasons why we've been deprived of this great tradition of Western literature, and sometimes just because of the conditions of history and the way that technology is changing and, and reorienting us to one another and to the world. It's all difficult. It all conspires to make rich soul food difficult to come by. And I'm very, very glad to help you obtain the classical education you didn't know you were missing. I'm also glad that you answered my request for feedback last week. I did a kind of new style of episode in which I just read a poem cold for the first time with you on the show. And I asked you if you enjoyed it, if it was helpful to you to get to know a text in this kind of line-by-line way and maybe see the nuts and bolts of how you might do that yourself at home, DIY. And you all wrote in, a lot of you wrote in with feedback, and I really appreciate that because it helps me to make sure the show is serving you, which is what it's here to do. So thank you, first of all, just for writing, and thank you for all of the very nice things that you said. Turns out this was a helpful thing to do. A lot of you responded positively and emailed me or DM'd me on Substack to say, hey, this was really great and I really enjoyed it. And it was interesting that one of the things a lot of people said was, this kind of reminds me of OG Young Heretics. And I thought, what does that mean? Like, OG Young Heretics? I feel like I've just been sitting here talking the whole time and delivering classical bits of wisdom and texts from the ancient world and the modern world and so on. But actually, when I thought about it, I realized, you know, the show has changed. And as we've been walking on our path together. I've grown and developed, you've grown and developed, and the show has kind of morphed into a broader and more maybe meandering thing than it initially was. When I started out, I would pick a text. I think our first text was the Iliad. And I would just say, here's what this book is and why you should know about it. And here are some detailed kind of portions of it, but here's why you should go away and read it, its significance in history and so on and so forth. And that was really the format of the show for a long time. Now, as I've started to develop my thinking more and to write some books of my own and also to really get down to brass tacks about how we're going to navigate the turbulent, I think, transition that we are 
facing and going already going through, but really facing in the future as well into this new te technological age, I've started to branch out into these larger, more sweeping kind of speculative episodes that we did for a while at the beginning of this year, like about morality and art and the relationship between science and faith. And uh, you, a lot of you have said, like, don't stop doing those. And I'm glad that you're enjoying that. And I, I am too. But I also don't want to stop delivering to you the thing that you came here for in the first place, which is really kind of a nuts and bolts survey course like you might get in college, but maybe you didn't get in college because of all this political mishigas or because you just it didn't really hit you at the first time or whatever, something that you can take with you out into your life and feel that you have more of a grounding in what I think of as the secret society of Western civilization, which is all of our birthright to be part of this grand but somehow underground society of, of people throughout time and space, centuries and centuries of thinking and striving and wrestling that have contrived to deliver to you a series of books and thoughts and philosophical arguments and paintings and plays and poems and music, all of which can enrich your life. And I do want to maintain some of that kind of service that and I, I'm hearing from you that you guys like that and that it's helpful to you and I maybe we can think about it a little bit like the episodes we've been doing lately are kind of like young heretics grad school or college courses where we're expanding our minds out into sort of larger essayistic thoughts but there's still a good reason to do grade school versions right of of the show and i don't mean that you should only listen to it if you're in, in elementary school or whatever but you want to get your nuts and bolts correct and to keep them correct you know you don't want to neglect the basics even as you start to go off in, into these larger tangents and, and so forth um and I've talked before on the show about the trivium and the quadrivium, which was this sort of medieval idea about education and how you would proceed to develop your mind. And it's still a pretty good model for us now, I think, where you say, well, you know, on the one hand, you have the trivium, which is kind of like the operating system of the mind. It's the mechanics of thinking and speaking, the three subjects, because the trivium is three methods or three ways of, of learning. The, the three subjects are rhetoric, grammar, and logic. And so these cover kind of how you can form thoughts correctly, how you can express yourself, how you can communicate, and so forth. But then the quadrivium, which is four different subjects, is the more advanced version. And that's how that's like the program that you run using the operating system. And it's four different sort of broadly speaking mathematical subjects, although mathematics is conceived in a much larger sense that includes things like music and geometry, but also astronomy and really all that we would think of as kind of a complete suite of arts education is, is comprised in the quadrivium as well as the latest in mathematics and in, and in science. And the reason that they come in that order is because you have to get the basics down right so that you can use them to understand and to think clearly in the larger subjects. But also, the larger subjects are what the smaller subjects are there for. In other words, you learn the operating system, you download the operating system so that you can run the program and do the thinking and eventually contribute originally to human knowledge and so forth. But you always have to be updating and tinkering with both. You always want your updating, you always want your operating system to be the latest version, as well as the programs that you're using to be the cutting edge, you know, up to date version of whatever it is you're, you're doing. And so all of this is just a way of saying, I think we're going to do some more episodes now that are more in the kind of nuts and bolts. Let's get to know some texts. Let's talk about what we're even doing here in the first place. And actually, I thought that today we could pull back the camera to something really basic, really first principles level, and just ask why we would ever want to read at all. Why do the stuff that we do together on this show? Why is it that you come here week after week to hear me yammer on about whoever I'm yammering on about, William Caxton or Thomas Wyatt or whatever? And because I feel like we all have a sense that there's richness in the, these great works and in the canon and in the books that have withstood the test of time. And I know that from very early on in my life, a feeling of that richness and a longing for the, the richness of what 
old books can offer has been kind of a defining feature of my experience. It's like a guiding force that pulls me towards certain books and certain pursuits and certain ideas and so forth. But it's kind of curious if you think about it that we have that spidey sense for something that really is going to feed us spiritually. And and I wanted to ask the question seriously, like, why are we doing all of this? What's the reason to read? Because if we know why we're reading, then we'll also know a little bit more about how to read and how to read well. And there's a reason that I started thinking about this. It's because, you know, when I got into the show in the first place, I, I really created it the way that I did because I... I I felt as if the right, the conservative part of the country, of, of America, um, and however broadly you want to understand that, but people who understand themselves as conservative or right-wing had positioned themselves as defenders of the canon, defenders of the West, and you'd see them, you know, and I include myself here, making these stirring speeches about how we must preserve Shakespeare on the reading list at English courses in college, and we must, our kids must be reading Milton and Plato and Aristotle and the greats, and we shouldn't let these leftist ideologues tear that down or try to rewrite the curriculum and so on and so forth. And this is all good and noble, and I agree with it and co-sign it all together, but I also noticed that in all the defending we were doing of the canon and the curriculum, there wasn't actually a lot of time left over for actually reading the books and spending atten- spending time and paying attention to the true merits of, of the literary world and of the literary life. And I was thinking about why that is, and I thought maybe it's because it, it, in some fundamental sense, this right-wing or conservative defense of the canon is a little bit defensive. It's a little bit reactive. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be having these fights in the public square. It doesn't mean that conservatives or even their well-meaning, nice, liberal fellow travelers shouldn't be strongly defending the canon as one of our great cultural assets. It's just that, you know, the reason that we find ourselves doing that is not actually a literary reason. It's not because the conservatives of the conservative movement were sitting around thinking, you know, what should we do with our time? Well, We love literature so much that we're going to really embark on a crusade for the revitalization of American education. It was more to do with the battle lines that were being drawn at the time in the culture wars. And you had really the first big flare-up of all this. I I shouldn't say the first, but one of the major ones in in this particular history is in the 1980s. And and that's when the new left, which is this kind of cultural neo-Marxist postmodern left that is gathering gathering steam in America and organizing around these issues of race and sexual grievance and so forth that are now familiar to us, the new left had made curriculum reform part of its project because its whole enterprise was based on these ideas about oppression and power and systems and hierarchies. And one of the major kind of premises, political premises of the new left is that America was founded on unjust power hierarchies. And so it wasn't a literary motivation that led them either. It was a political motivation. And it was because their political aspirations kind of included the canon or college instruction got kind of rolled up into the the new left project as one of the parts of America that was unjust, needed to be deconstructed, needed to be reworked to include the certain quote-unquote perspectives and voices and, you know, to undo past injustice. And unlike other critiques of America that were more about tinkering at the margins and saying we need to live up more to the American dream, the American spirit. I mean, you might think of the Martin Luther King idea that we're living out the content of our creed, that we would live up to what we're saying we're all about. This new left critique was much more like the whole thing is rotten. It's rotten all the way down. And so this is when you get, like in 1987, I think it is, Jesse Jackson and these students in Stanford start chanting very famously, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And this led to all sorts of curriculum reform at the college level and the 
quote unquote dismantlement or decolonization, you might now call it, of the syllabus and all these standard courses. And it's it's around this time that Alan Bloom writes the closing of the American mind, reflecting on his experiences at the University of Chicago as the attack on classics and the Western canon really kind of gets going. And then in the 90s, you have what's called the Curriculum Wars, which extends down from the university level into like K through 12. And what are your kids going to be learning in, in you know, lower education in high school and, and in grade school and so forth. And all of this is now kind of snowballing from this original new left idea that what we need to do is dismantle the entire thing and rebuild from the ground up. It's going to be a year zero, basically, of American life, if if American is even what we're going to call it. So in one sense, of course, obviously, I created this show because I think all of that is garbage, and I hate all of that, and I think it's a terrible disservice to kids to people that otherwise could be formed and shaped by these wonderful books that I've known and loved my whole life. And I think it's based on fundamentally false premises, a fundamentally naive idea about what humanity and human history is capable of producing, and this fantastical imaginary thought that if we start afresh, we won't have any of the problems that our mean, bad, nasty forebears have, when in fact they achieved fantastic things precisely because they knew that out of the crooked timber of humanity no straight thing is ever made but they did the very best they could and much of it was truly great and so we ought not to jettison all of that as Burke reminded the French revolutionaries you know if you start afresh you won't actually get your clean pure utopia you'll just get savagery and so I'm very much on that side of things politically but I did notice at the same time as I was kind of embarking on this show that, like, none of that is really about the love of literature per se. In fact, literature and classical education can kind of become this political football in this larger argument that's going on about power and hierarchies and oppression and uh, whether America is good or not. And so when the right picked up the standard of defending the canon, it wasn't necessarily because the Reagan coalition was filled with people that just loved to lounge about on a Thursday afternoon and read Proust. I mean, some of them did, don't get me wrong. William F. Buckley was a very cultivated, educated guy, and a lot of the people that were part of that, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s conservative movement were perfectly well read, but they weren't like the literature coalition. And often, in fact, the the Reagan coalition included all of these, you know, kind of economics wonks that were much more about the hard sciences and national prosperity and, and military greatness and all, again, all good things, but none of them really a uh, sort of delivery system for literary sophistication, which is one reason why this helps to explain why the right is often shaking its fist about how we must defend the culture and we need to take back the culture, but we often don't seem very good at that. It's because, in fact, a lot of the culture itself is not right wing coded, except in so far as conservatism is about reality and reality is represented in in art but artists themselves aren't naturally conservatives and conservatives aren't automatically are artists or literary sophisticates in fact often you'll find that in the arts there's a ton of kooky leftists that make beautiful art and uh, this is an unfortunate reality that people you disagree with politically can in fact see the world in a particular way that's very useful or powerful or moving and you have to kind of incorporate that into your understanding of what art is if you want to mount a valid defense that really does come out of love for the West and, and, and the Western canon especially which has to do with literary matters and so it's not actually enough to read great books or to argue for reading great books because the other bad guys are saying that you shouldn't, because there are these leftists that want to destroy the curriculum. That's not actually a good enough reason to read, and it's not actually a reason that is going to inspire you with the energy that it takes. And let's admit it, it does take energy to, like, actually crack open these big difficult books and actually wrestle with the hard questions that are raised 
within them. You can't just do that because you want to stick it to the man or to the left or to whatever. And, and that's actually not why books are around or why you should read books. What you need is a positive, love-motivated reason for reading books in and of themselves and for living a literary life and a life of the mind that would be there even if none of this political ballyhoo had ever started in the first place, even if there were no culture wars and you didn't identify with the right or with the left, there would still be or there should still be a reason why you are reading, why you care about the canon, why you want to engage with this stuff. And so what I wanted to talk about and what I want this show always really to be about is that, the political, politically independent way of reading and wanting to read. Not because I'm a political independent. I'm always uh, honest with you guys that I have political commitments. But because I think that in order to truly enrich yourself with the treasures of the Western canon, you have to do your reading for its own sake. And you have to engage with the Western canon for its own sake and on its own terms. And this is especially important, I think, now that the internet is, I would say, at least threatening to destroy the life of reading, to kind of end the book, put an end to book culture in some profound way. We all know that social media and streaming and all of these new technologies have brought back oral and visual culture in a big way. We listen to things, we watch things, we look at snippets of pictures and little clips and all that, but we read less and less, and the publishing industry is suffering because of it. And, you know, maybe this actually goes back to the creation of movies and TV, but it's certainly been hypercharged, accelerated by the creation of digital technology. And there are even people that will say, you know, the printing press created the book and made it central to our cultural life and that had a good run you know 500 years or so but now the internet is doing the same thing and it's going to replace the book and books are going to become obsolete and there is actually no good reason really to read at least as a kind of defining practice that really takes pride of place in in your life and and books are kind of over would be this argument they're going the way of the dinosaur they're going the way of the athenian marketplace whatever you know, previous oral culture that was replaced by the book. Now the book is going to be re replaced by digital culture. And I would say maybe. I mean, I would use actually a digital meme to respond to this, and I would say press X to doubt. Like, it, it's, it's possible that this will be true and that something else, some new art form, will emerge out of digital culture that makes books unnecessary and means that you don't, anymore have to read Shakespeare or read the great works in order to fully educate yourself and fully form yourself. But I'm skeptical because one thing I've noticed is that the new forms that the internet has created, forms like the podcast, like what you're listening to right now, but also the social media feed or the, you know, streaming content or, you know, the, the TikTok video or the Vine video before that, um... The technology in, in those forms represents a forward advance, but so far, at least, those forms themselves actually represent, to me, a step backward in the ability to understand yourself and to compose your own personality and your own personhood. We all feel it the way that those forms, the, that little phone in your pocket and that TV show that you binge watch, it doesn't actually help to make you more grounded, more stable, more coherent. In fact, in many cases, it distracts you and it pulls your attention in multiple different directions, kind of splinters you, leaves you feeling more confused, more drained, more tired. And this is not like some digital pessimist take. Everybody knows I'm online all the time. I'm not saying you should never use your smartphone phone or whatever. I'm just saying that if it turns out that the book is replaced by some more digital form that we all just end up scrolling on our iPads or something now in the future, that will actually represent a loss of something. It won't just be a neutral transition from one historical period to another. It will be a step backward, a retrogression from the culture of the book. And this leads me into my number one answer to the question, why read? That is not based on politics, that doesn't have anything to do with the culture wars or the 
uh, the curriculum wars or the campus wars or any war, metaphorical or otherwise. And it's purely about what the book does. And that is, you should read because it will form you into an individual. It will make you into the person that you can most fully be. Without books in your life, you will not be as well-defined, distinct, and coherent an individual as you would otherwise be. It is the form that is unique. Reading a book is the form that is uniquely suited to carving out of the raw material of you an individual, well-defined, sophisticated human soul. It makes you who you are, and it shapes you day by day as you read. And the reason for that is that the book is basically the best technology for containing another human mind. So when you read a book, of course, you're not getting yourself. It's somebody else that's in there. But just like a human being, a book contains within limited boundaries an entire world unto itself. And what you're getting in a way that no other object can really give you is this delivery mechanism for the world as seen through other eyes. And you and your eyes and your understanding and your place in the world will be more and more clearly defined the more you allow yourself to be shaped by the vision and the experience and just the personhood of each book that you read. And in fact, the more I think about it, the more I realize this really is what the printing press gave us. It gave us this idea that writing wasn't just a tool we could use to outsource our thoughts until a later time when we could be reminded of them and they would be internal. It was itself a kind of second self, another person. And it's not as if nobody had ever thought of this idea before, but it's actually pretty remarkable when you start to think about it Writing a book in the sense of creating one of those objects that we now think of as the classic like mass market paperback, you know, which comes out of the octavo and the larger folio formats that they would produce in those printing presses. But to create one of those objects specifically is to create a little message in a bottle where you pour basically yourself, your consciousness, your way of seeing the world into it. You stopper it up and then you lob it out into the ocean and you send it into the world. And it's not like nobody ever thought of that idea before the printing press, but it's amazing to notice how it really does take off after the printing press, which in England is introduced by William Caxton in the 1400s. And really in the couple hundred years after that, it's when we start to get this idea that we are almost ourselves books, and so we need to be shaped by encounters with other people, that is, by encounters with other books. And so if social media kind of takes you apart and pulls you in a bunch of different directions and unravels you into smaller and smaller threads, books put you back together. And that's a marvelous thing that I still think no other technology can do. And it's becoming more and more necessary as we move into a more and more digital culture. The internet still has not replaced the book with something else when it comes to this particular thing, which is shaping and molding the soul into an individual. And it's not an accident that it comes up during this time, which is precisely when the whole concept of the individual starts to emerge. I mean, Harold Bloom wrote a book called Shakespeare and the Invention of the Human, because it's in the 1400s, 1500s, and then on into the 1600s that with the Protestant Reformation, with the printing press, with the creation of the book, and with the the advent of science and all of these new developments, one of the things that that does is it shapes humanity into individuals. And it creates this idea that, you know, what is the basic unit of our humanity? Does humanity come served up fundamentally in families? Does it come in couples or in tribes? Is that is, is a nation sort of the primary unit of humanity and then people and individuals are just little subdivisions of that nation? Or does it come in fundamentally in the individual? Is the individual the atom of society? And of course, of course, we need all of our different ways of relating to each other. But this fundamentally modern concept that you are something unique and distinctive and not to be replaced by any other interchangeable part, that arises in this moment when we are starting to learn about the 
primacy of each individual human spirit and understanding. And we don't, I don't think, want to lose that as we move on into the digital age. There, we may need to enhance it or, tra you know, it might become new in some remarkable ways, but we can't, I don't think, lose the individual. And it's through the creation of the book that the individual is formed and sharpened and, and given definition. And it's really amazing, you know, we take this for granted because we live in a world that's had printed books for hundreds and hundreds of years. But in fact, when you look at it, you realize it's not guaranteed that this that it would be this way, that you and your unique vision of the world and your distinctive set of traits would be thought of as this kind of irreplaceable base unit of humanity. And it's through the book that you can shape that and develop that sense. And I was I was thinking about this as I was starting to, you know, talk through it with myself and think about what I was going to say to you today about why to read. And I, I noticed that actually it is in the age of the printing press that you get this whole new way of thinking and talking about the self as a kind of, of book. And it, it's not that the idea that there's a book within you is as unheard of before the printing press, but it, it's kind of conspicuous by its rarity when you start to examine like pre-15th century literature. And there are some places where the book comes up as a metaphor in ancient literature. It's not as if ancient authors didn't use this idea of the book as a metaphor for other things, but it's usually not. The book is usually not an image for what you are and what I am. Often you'll get something like Psalm 19, right, where the skies are a sefer, they are a book, and, the, and God's glory is written upon the skies or the heavens. And so nature is one thing that people often compare to a book. Galileo used that metaphor, but Augustine used it before him. The, there's the book of nature and the book of scripture. In Revelation, God has a book of life in which he inscribes the names of the saved. And so this idea that there's something outside of us that we can read and learn from called nature, and that's a book, that's, that's quite common. But the idea that you would look inward and find a whole other book written in the soul is actually kind of daring in the ancient world. And there are some places where you would naturally expect to find it in the Bible that it doesn't show up. And so I, I thought about this too, you know, in, in another psalm, Psalm 139, excuse me, um, you get this idea that God knows everything about you, that he's looked and searched and understood every part of you. And this is a famous psalm, you know, that has searched me and known me. And I can't help thinking that if a modern writer had written this, he would have said, God can read you like a book. God can read your inward heart the way that one can read a book. But the psalmist actually doesn't say that. He says, you have seen, searched, known. He does not say read. And there's one verse where he talks about books and, and writing. And actually what he says is, your eyes, this is verse 16, thine eyes did see mine unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written. So God has like an inventory of parts that he keeps written down before he makes you. This is the image that, that the psalmist is using here. But he doesn't then read you like that book. The book is like a kind of memory aid for him or, or like a representation of his knowledge of what it takes to make you. But you are not compared to a book there. And similarly, I was thinking about in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where the it's said that God can see directly into the heart. I thought that would be a place where perhaps the heart is compared to a book. But again, it, it's more about seeing and not about reading, right? It, it is not, God does not see as man seeth. This is 1 Samuel 16 verse 7. Uh, God does not see as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So really books are these kind of external things in the imagery of a lot of the Bible in a place where you might expect to get in internal book imagery, the imagery of you being a book, but it really doesn't show up as much as you would expect it to. You get this kind of external idea of the, of the book outside of you. And when there is an idea, when, the, when you do get an image of the inward book, the book inside of you, it's actually kind of daring and radical. And the place I th think it comes most immediately to mind is in the epistles, uh, both in Romans 2 and in 2 Corinthians 3, these two letters of the New Testament, where you do get this idea, which is actually really radical, and which doesn't sound radical to us now because we're so used to it, but it was just quite surprising that God is now going to write 
his law on your heart. And there you do get this explicit book metaphor, but it's a transformation of what's gone before because the law is supposed to be written outside of you. It's in the Torah, it's in the book, right? And that book is external and it's not something that you can generate from within. It's something that lives outside of you and you can go and consult it. But now with the advent of Jesus, the authors of the New Testament are saying that thing outside of you, that source, that container of information is now going to be transferred and etched onto your own inner heart. And so this is envisioning a radical transformation of humanity precisely through an act of God, God's intervention into the world. And it goes back to one other book metaphor that we do get in the Old Testament from Jeremiah, but it's about the end of days or about the revelation or some cataclysmic event where he says, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my law in their inward parts. But that's a total transformation. That's a total change from what has gone before the event that Jeremiah is talking about, which is when the Jews and God were in this covenant and God gave them a physical an outward book to, to read. Now, says Jeremiah, in this new covenant, you're going to get the book written inwardly on your heart. And so what I guess I'm saying here is that the creation of the printed book and the culture that arises with books at its center, where people are reading all the time to communicate with one another, is kind of like a technological advance toward the fulfillment of a, a certain prophecy, which is that human beings are going to be the central source of information and knowledge that comes to them from God, of course, but that is not external. And you, typically you get this like idea before this that the book is like this kind of memory aid. And this is how books were used in the ancient world often, that it wasn't you would sit at home alone reading this book and having this direct silent communion with some author. It was that the book is a place where things were written down that you could remind yourself of, and then they would be in your head and in, in your mind. But now it's like the book becomes another self for you to engage in a conversation with. Um, and, and it's no longer this kind of scroll, which is what typically ancient authors mean when they say the word book, like Sefer or, or Biblion. Typically you're thinking of a scroll that can be kind of this limitless surface to write something on. Um, a book is like this little contained object where you have another mind, another human being. And you are in some ways the same as this other human being. You're meeting, you're having this fundamental meeting between the book that somebody has written into and the book that is written in, in your heart. And by shaping those two things against one another. It's like iron sharpens iron. And so that's what a book is there to do. It's to impress itself upon what the ancients might have called the wax of your soul. This is an indispensable thing, and it is something that has come into being, not out of nowhere, but out of this gradual transformation that was worked in the heart of man through, I think, the revelation and the incarnation, but also with these technological means through the creation of the book, which has yet to be surpassed for this purpose, for the purpose of soul formation, for the purpose of gradually shaping you into the fullest and most defined individual you can be. And it really is remarkable. The more I thought about this, the more I realized that, like, our way of thinking of this really does come into being with the, the printing press and with the book. I was, I was thinking like, well, what about the idea that you can read somebody like a book, right? This casual phrase that we use all the time, this idiom, or, you know, that you can read someone's mind. It was like, surely those sayings have been around forever. Uh, but then I, I go looking in the uh, American Heritage Dictionary of Idioms, which is a very useful reference work that traces idioms to, to their source. And I find that, in fact, to... Uh, read somebody's mind is a phrase that at least the author of this book can only find as far back as the 1800s. So that's not a phrase that people have always used. It's a phrase that comes into being as the book and the individual and all of that starts to come into its own. And similarly, when I look in the entry for reading someone like an open book, when you say that, you say read someone like a book, that's such a cliche. We take it so for granted. But that too seems to come from around the mid 1800s. And there's a really interesting entry in the Heritage Dictionary, in the American Heritage Dictionary of Idioms, where the uh, author says to read someone like an open book, meaning to discern someone's thoughts or feelings, 
variations of this metaphor were used by Shakespeare. And I was like, oh, that makes sense because that's what I've been, in the back of my mind as I was thinking through this, I was like, somewhere I've heard somebody from a while ago talking about reading people like books, but it's actually kind of an innovation in Shakespeare, which is when a lot of these developments are taking place, when the printing press is starting to take hold. And he says, she, the, she quotes uh, two passages, one from Romeo and Juliet, read o'er the volume of young Paris face. And one from Troilus and Cressida, Oh, like a book of sport, thou read me over. And again, these strike us as fairly banal sentiments, but they're only banal because Shakespeare is one of the ones who's inscribing this idea on our hearts and on our collective mind. And it's during this time when the book is starting to take its place as the kind of central cultural object. And we, again, we, we do not want to lose this. I was thinking of another passage, actually, that isn't quoted in the Dictionary of Idioms, but here's Hamlet right after he's encountered his father's ghost in Act 1, Scene 4. He says, Oh, all you host of heaven, and the ghost has, has explained that Hamlet's uh, uncle, Claudius, has killed his him, his father, and asking for revenge. This is the plot of Hamlet, is that the ghost wants Hamlet to, to avenge him uh, of his father's death. And, he's, and Hamlet says, O all you host of heaven, O earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? O fie, hold, hold my heart, and you my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, I thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. So he's saying, in this distracted world, if memory has a seat, I will, I will remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. So look at the way Hamlet talks about himself. It's like a book with all these other sayings and things that he's read inscribed in it, but now he's had this one experience that as long as memory holds her seat in this distracted globe, he will be fixed like a book that is written with his father's saying and his commandment. And literature, if you gradually take the time to, to read it, does do this to you. It does shape you and it grounds you and steadies you against a world that wants to pick you apart into little pieces. It's reading that reforms you and creates that book of your mind that can be shaped into something distinctive, somebody with opinions that he can hold and stand firm with against the blows and buffets of the world. Cormac McCarthy, the great novelist who died recently, said books are made of other books. And so if we are metaphorically books, then we too are made and shaped through our encounter with the great minds of the past and, and in books. And I do think that as our world pro progresses in this all these sort of terrifying ways, we're going to need that anchor more and more because actually there are innumerable forces constantly trying to tear us away from our own individuality. And sometimes the world will try to stuff you back into some tribe or box that is going to erase your individuality and subsume it under some larger project. And I think a lot of identity politics is like this. You know, you're not so much an individual as you are a black trans Latina woman or whatever, right? As a non-binary person of color or as a this or that, then you, you don't get to make your own personal decisions. You just stand in as this kind of representative of a group. Or you look at the way that certain political movements think about individuals as kind of pawns. I mean, the Soviet Union is the grand example of this sort of machine state that wants to subordinate the individual to some larger tribe. But even in kind of trad politics, you get this too. You, you should never deviate from the roles you're supposed to play. We all ought to live this particular trad life. You know, these are all impulses to, to flee away from our own individuality. And then there's a version of this that wants to pick you apart, as I've already been saying, into smaller pieces to compartmentalize. You have your Facebook self over here. Maybe you have a particular relationship to one set of chemicals in your brain that you're trying to medicate away. And that's just boiling us down, breaking us down in this acid bath to something less than individuals. But the individual is still an, an inescapable and indispensable portion of God's 
creation. It's where all things take their truest shape is in the experience of the individual. We can't lose that. And books are still, I think, the technology for shaping and nourishing and forming an individual human soul. If you want to know why to read in 2024 when there's so much else on TV and so many other things demanding your attention, this is why. It's because the alternative to a life of reading, to a life spent with books, is basically expressed by that Apple commercial that made a big a negative splash recently. I don't know if you saw this online, but they made a new iPad that I guess is thinner than everything else they've ever made. And they put out this advertisement that was just so perfect because it was completely tone deaf. And it demonstrated that the publicity team at Apple, at least, just still doesn't understand what everybody is so worried about with this technological age. And they can't help themselves from presenting their technology as all the worst things that we fear about it. And what happens in this commercial is that you get this, I don't know, it's like a compressor of the kind that you would, you know, use to crush a car after you didn't want the car anymore when they, if you've ever seen those big machines that kind of crush cars into little tiny cubes. And they take this compressor and in it they put all of this messy, beautiful, creative stuff, all of these objects like pianos and paint and, uh, you know, a mixing studio and just all these different physical objects that we use to express our creativity. And they just crush it down into this little tiny iPad and it kind of explodes and then reemerges as this one thin tablet. And it's like, yeah, that's what we're afraid of. We don't want you to sell us the, the technology that way. We want the technology to be a medium for enhancing all this other stuff that we do, not this kind of destructive replacement that shrinks it all down or, you know, compresses it into this weird melange and loses all of its form. And it's it's funny that Apple did that because they think that's an advertisement and we're all out here going like, no, no, not like that, like anything but that. And, and I do think that, you know, even though we're not going to get rid of technology, you're not going to stop using your phone or whatever, the phone is this kind of black mirror, as it's often called, that sucks you in and like scrambles all of your categories and kind of disorients. And it's books that can anchor you again and that can return you to this individual sense of your humanity and the humanity of others, which is so indispensable that we can't possibly let go of it. And this leads me to one last thing that I will say about how not to read. I get a lot of questions and requests about this where people will say, can you please deliver a list of the best five works in all of Western literature, the indispensable canon of 10, 20, 100, whatever, books, plays, movies that I, that I need to read or watch in order to truly be educated in this tradition. And I like a good listicle as much as anybody else. It's not like I won't answer that question. And in fact, if you go to the newjerusalem.substack.com, my dad and I do this Friday thing where every Friday we'll recommend one new work of art that we think you have to read or see. And I also have mentioned before the collection, The uh, Great Books of the Western World, which if you want kind of a good survey of texts to get your feet wet in the Western canon, that's that's as good a place to start as any. But I have to kind of disappoint here a little bit with this question, or at least just challenge the assumption that I think is behind it. Sometimes when people ask me for the list of the best books or whatever, I think they're they're thinking about reading in kind of the wrong way. They're thinking about this project that they have to undertake, a chore or a homework assignment, where if they can just get through enough, then they will be an educated person. Like, one day you're not an educated person, then you are an educated person. It's after you've read these 100 books, then you can count yourself as truly literate or sophisticated, and then you'll be like all the cool kids that you see on TV who just seem to know all of these different books. And I'm here to tell you that that is not how that works. Uh, It's not how that works because literature is not actually an assignment or a finite collection of things. It's not even a definite canon, although there are some things that definitely do belong in the canon. Nobody could authoritatively say, well, it's only these 200 books and not these 300 others. And the reason for that is not because there aren't 
books that are greater than others or lists that you could make that would be plausible. It's because literature is actually a way of life and reading is a way of life. And that's because what you're doing when you're reading is you're forming your character. You're allowing other minds to shape your soul and you're letting it seep into the kind of substrate of your existence. You're letting it seep into the sand kind of underneath your conscious mind and transform you and guide the way you live and think and become a part of you. And to do that, you don't just have to spend one intensive summer reading as many books as you can. You actually have to make this, incorporate this into your life. And so don't go away and try to read every possible book you can. And don't even feel like you, this means you have to devote every waking minute to, to reading. In fact, my advice would be, instead of trying to get a list from someone that you trust about you know, which books you have to read, just make it a habit to spend 30 minutes a day reading a book and try to make those books worthwhile. Don't just read like Fifty Shades of Grey or something. But if you really want to know my advice for how to get started reading, it's that first and foremost. Just like in the gym, consistency is key. And that those 30 minutes may well start to expand out. And you may find yourself reading in times when you would otherwise, I know this is sacrilegious to say, you, you know, you might find yourself exchanging Netflix for books and exchanging video games for books sometimes and reading when you would otherwise be watching movies or any of that. But even if you don't, that's fine. I mean, you really can just do 30 minutes and that will itself work its way into your soul, shape you and form you into an individual, which is what you were born to be. All right. I just wanted to take some time to talk about why why we do this at all. Because it's been a minute, I think, since we really took a close look at the point and purpose of this show. It's not to win and score a political victory, although I like political victories as much as anybody, it's because I believe that you personally will be blessed and shaped by a life spent in relationship with great literature. Uh, let me take a mailbag question. Mailbag questions come to me mostly through Substack at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. So you got to subscribe if you want to ask a question, and you can either email me or, or drop me a note in the DMs, which is what Stephen has done with this question here. He says, Hi, Spencer. I recently had a thought about Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended with tongues of flame on the apostles and the crowd all heard them speaking in their own tongues. Could this moment be viewed as a sort of reversal of Babel? After scattering the people and scrambling their languages at Babel, God sent his spirit to introduce his son, the word, to all the nations, each in his own tongue. I doubt this thought is original, but it felt like a question for you and young heretics. Love the show. Thanks. Okay, cool. Awesome, Stephen. And this is a very timely question because Pentecost is coming up. It's this Sunday in most liturgical calendars, and it is the festival where we remember the descent of the Holy Spirit. So there's a Thursday, usually the week before Ascension Sunday comes, on Thursday you get or rather, the week before Pentecost Sunday comes, you get a Thursday that is a, a called Ascension Day, when Christ ascended into heaven, and he told his disciples that if they prayed, he would send the Holy Spirit. And 50 days after that Passover, on which Jesus was crucified and then was resurrected, there is another Jewish holiday, ancient traditional Jewish holiday, that comes 50 days after Passover every year. And in Greek, the word for 50th is Pentecoste. So, hey, Pentecoste, hey, Mara is the 50th day. And that's all Pentecost means. It just means the 50th day. Well, what happens on the 50th day? There is another celebration in Hebrew called Shavuot, which commemorates the giving of the Torah when God dictated the book, speaking of books, to God, or to Moses, rather, on Sinai. And it's a commemoration, a celebration of Scripture and of the delivery of Scripture. And in exactly that transformation, that transition that I was talking about, where God in the New Covenant writes his word not on some other book, but on the human heart inwardly, on the soul and on the spirit, now Pentecost comes in the same way that Easter is the Christian version, in some sense, of Passover. Now Pentecost is the Christian version of Shavuot in that the Holy Spirit comes to write that New Covenant on the heart and inwardly give mankind access to God's will and God's love through the incarnation and through Jesus. And so that transition, that transformation that I talked about as being culminated really in the culture of the book and in, and in reading culture becomes sort of 
physical and miraculous in Pentecost, and that's the story of it. And Stephen has asked, doesn't this kind of undo the Tower of Babel story? And yes, absolutely, this is also a miraculous reversal of what happens in the Tower of Babel story in Genesis, where mankind tries to create for itself a language that will be this kind of physical external object, maybe a statue or an artistic language or an image, maybe a book, we don't know, where there's, there's going to be this kind of like one set of words that will serve as God and, they, and will serve ultimately the interests of the powerful and of the king. And to thwart this, God intervenes and creates a scenario where no one language is spoken and the world speaks many different languages and in fact it's no it's never going to be the case again that any one political power can unite all of the peoples under one banner and one rule but now instead of that instead of bringing everything into one kind of unified system with only one language Notice that what God has done, and this is something that's prefigured in a lot of the prophecies, uh, especially in Isaiah about the peoples coming back to Zion, is he's preserved the individuality of each language. Because what happens in the Pentecost miracle is that people, Elamites and Romans and, and Jews and Greek speakers and people who speak all these different kinds of languages all hear one sermon in their own mother tongue. And so the gospel is preached, but those who are listening miraculously understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit, but they understand it in their particular individual languages. And so we're undoing, God is undoing Babel, but not by restoring a kind of monotonous outward unity, but by restoring a spiritual unity, the unity of the spirit that then expresses itself in all these different various and, and uh, differential ways. And that's the transformation that we've been talking about. The creation of the individual is not a destruction of the image of God, but it's a further and further and greater and greater refinement of the image of God in all these many different individuals. There are as many ways of, of depicting God as there are human beings because every human being is a little depiction of God. And that process is mirrored in this process where God doesn't destroy diversity. He just unifies but diversity by establishing himself as the principle above that transcends all of our individual differences. And this is why in Isaiah, the peoples that come back to Zion also come bearing all of their different cultural artifacts and attributes, because it's not that the world is going to be made unified in some superficial sense, and everybody's going to look the same and talk the same and act the same, but rather that all of these different cultures, all of the things that are good about human life are going to be turned to the service of God. And so they will be one in Christ, but not flattened out into total unity or sameness. This is, as, uh, as Stephen has intimated, not an idea that he or I came up with. And here I have to recommend to you a series called Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. If you've ever, if you've ever wondered, like, you know, I can't be the first person to think about this. Where can I find other commentary on this? The Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture series is really great because all, all it does is just takes the books of the Bible and then delivers a commentary, like verse by verse, except the commentary isn't some guy just writing and commenting on the verses. It's just a selection from Augustine and Cyril of Jerusalem and Orator and whoever they can find that has written in the ancient world about this. And when I went to the story in Acts about Pentecost, I found there's a little passage from from Cyril and from Bede, who was the monk in uh, 7th and 8th century England that we know about really for uh, cementing B.C. and A.D. in our minds. But here's what Bede says. He says, The church's humility recovers the unity of languages that the pride of Babylon has shattered. Spiritually, however, the variety of languages signifies gifts of a variety of graces. Truly, therefore, it is not inconsistent to understand that the Holy Spirit first gave to human beings the gifts of languages, by which human wisdom is both learned and taught extrinsically, so that he might thereby show how easily he can make people wise through the wisdom of God, which is within them. And so it's this internalization, right, of the unity that we seek through external unity, um, which is... Uh, exactly part of this journey that we've made as a species throughout centuries away from idolatry and into the individual relationship with God, which is part of God writing his law on our hearts. 
And that's why you should read. <laughs> All right, that's quite enough for one day. And I will just note, since I always have a segment called I Maked This, where I introduce you to other things I'm doing, that that list of interesting works can be found at thenewjerusalem.substack.com. And I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Here's to the next million downloads.